adjacent stage A. The University of California at Riverside, in the United States, is going to be talking to us about fungi indoors, creating the appropriate databases for fungal research. Thank you. Thanks very much to the organizers and for all of you for being here. Um, I'm going to tell you about some projects that we have, um, a project we have working on dealing with fungal genomes, and it's uh, a bit similar to some of the things you've seen before, but I'll try to emphasize some of the different resources that we put together. There's, there'll be some links throughout, and I'll be happy to put these slides up for people to want to follow up later. So fungi are beautiful, um, and they make all kinds of different cool forms, and I'm interested in my lab in terms of how this diversity evolved um, and how these fungi uh, establish the different niches that they live in. Um, and we are blessed in this age to have lots of genomes in terms of um, differences in genome size. There's interesting correlations with pathogenicity and, and, um, and, and complexity of organisms with genome size, but there's also lots of other uh, interesting parameters that we can find out of these. But um, the question is, does this really represent the true, um, the, the true understanding of fungi? And so the, um, the attempts to really fill in this tree of life, and especially with uh, all of the work that's being done with metagenomics, the, the emphasis on having better reference genomes will help a lot in um, being able to describe those communities better with having a better set of reference genomes. And so to that extent, we have launched yet another number of genomes that ends in uh, a thousand or, or some, some multiple of that. Um, and so this is a project that's um, going through the JGI. And the point being that we've sampled some of the diversity. And you can see in these different colors representing uh, blue are the ones where genomes have, have been sampled in red and uh, are ones that we are proposing. And then there's additional diversity. But we, ch we chose a thousand because we, we think there's probably about 500 families of fungi that have been described. And so to get sort of the Noah's Ark of fungi to have two per uh, to per, to per clade it was be an important starting step. And so our, uh, our work in, in my laboratory, for example, I'm not getting a chance to talk about it here, but we, do, we are very interested in the early diverging fungi to understand uh, some of the bases both for, for evolution of pathogenicity. So this is the, a major cause of amphibian decline is Petrachochytrium, and so that's a, an important, um, important emerging uh, disease as well as some of the most earliest branches in the fungi to understand um, how these, these came about. So um, what we've put together as part of FungiDB, which is um, in collaboration with the UPathDB, and you saw um, at least their logo on one of the slides um, earlier, uh, is, which is part of the NIH-funded uh, BRCs. But um, FungiDB uh, is, uh, is an augment to that, since uh, eukaryotic pathogens did not include fungi uh, in the first uh, set of those databases, but we're now able to bring uh, lots of those tools that have been developed for eukaryotes uh, towards the fungi. And so the point of these resources is to make available uh, these data mining tools. And so this is just a list of the, the first release that we had of the database last year uh, with 18 species, genomes, uh, 17 species, and then an additional set that we've, um, we've added in to emphasize some comparative um, uh, resources. And so this is still a ramping up project uh, to get the full complexity of the, of the kingdom that, that has been sampled, but I wanted to um, tell you a little bit about what you can do with the system right now. And so UPathDB, uh, the software that's involved in that, uh, allows you to build what, what uh, is call, are called strategies. And this allows you to uh, query the data uh, to generate questions that you can then save and rerun. And so uh, the point being that you oftentimes do lots of searches that let you meander around different kinds of analyses, but oftentimes it's harder to get back and rerun that query when the data is updated or if you want to share that query with somebody else. And so uh, the, the system is, is, is emphasizes the ability to save these queries and provide it uh, to, to collaborators or as the joke is, you give it to your students, you can, you can email them in the middle of the night this link and say, these are some really great candidate genes that we found. Um, here you go, here's how we found them, and, and, and go start working on them. And so you have this matrix of different types of queries that you can run. I'm just going to walk you through some of the ways that this is available. Um, but uh, what, we have, what we've cooked up for different examples, so uh, this is a human fungal pathogen, and there, um, one of the questions might be to try to develop new drug targets for this fungus, uh, be able to identify genes that are conserved in only certain groups of, um, only, only fungi, and so genes that are not found in, in say, bacteria or animals, um, but have orthologs to well-known um, enzyme pathways. And so this allows you to essentially construct that simple query with a couple of really simple steps. And, um, and then get the list and start to um, explore that in more detail. Uh, and so uh, 
to give you more concrete examples, we'll talk about data like functional data uh, coming from RNA-seq. And in this case, we would have, uh, we, we've generated a few RNA-seq experiments that we put into the system. Uh, here's one where we're growing hyphae on a plate. We've, we've taken time points. Oops, sorry, these are, this is an example where we've done a knockout and, um, and an overexpression experiment, and we can compare the differences in expression between them, identify genes that are, say, fourfold upregulated or, or, or downregulated between uh, the, the two comparisons, and then we get back a list of genes. That's very nice. Um, the list of genes are very helpful for starting points, but you want to mine into that more in more detail. So, of course, you can sort this and try to find your most um, highly uh, upregulated genes, for example. Um, you can also save this query, so this becomes a, a query that you can save with a, a URL that you can't really read, but it's up there. And then um, you, can, you can share that with your collaborators. You can make short links and whatnot. But um, what's important is it's not just doing a single query, but that you can, you can add on to these queries and um, uh, do, do more things with that with those lists. Let me show you what a gene page looks like first. So if you clicked on one of those genes, you'd see a standard gene page that you see for uh, most model or organism databases. This also includes a view of the uh, synteny around the gene. So we have uh, five different seer types that have been sequenced, and so they're very highly syntenic. You can see that, and you can scroll down and see other information like conserved alignments to other, um, to other more distantly related species as well as um, hits through the uh, translated searches. And we've also generated orthologs among these genomes, so you can um, start to take those, those sets of genes that you found in your, up, your expression experiment and uh, look at them in other species where there may have been more uh, functional data uh, generated or, or um, knockouts or whatnot. And um, so you can see in this case, this, this is a single copy gene in most of these other species. They all have one copy of it except for Tremella, which has two. Um, and then we can, of course, go down to the gene page and see summaries of information like this is how the gene, gene um, expression looks across the three different time points in that, or three different conditions of that particular experiment. So hopefully the differences between these came out as the f at least fourfold, and that you can see that right there. So, um, and then of course you can see the sequence of the, the gene itself. So another type of query that we do is the ability to take the EST data and, and search that. And so, for example, um, in another fungus called Neurospor, which is a model system we work on in our lab, we might be interested to know, are there any novel genes out there? So we can, we can do a query where we ask for all the ESTs um, that, 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 that are aligned to the genome that do not overlap a gene. I'm not going to show you the, the query page. You get back a list of genes. And then you can, um, you can zoom over to the genome browser. And for example, the query that I ended up generating for this particular one was this this set here, and so I asked for all of the gene, all of the ESTs that, that aligned to the genome, but didn't have a gene that overlapped it. And so I get this little candidate here, and I've also put in our RNA seq data into the browser, so you can you can start to look at this and, and say, okay, well we need to curate this gene because it looks like because the expression is common across this whole region that um, this is probably uh, an unannotated five prime UTR. So um, this system allows the ability to go in and generate this curation, and the emphasis is that. This isn't just for one organism. We can build these resources up, and we're, we have many so-called orphan genomes in that they're, they're generated and published, and there isn't a lot of, um, there isn't the ability to continue to curate them from the original sequencing group, but um, the system um, allows you to, um, I'll show you at the end, allows you to add um, annotation to the, to, the, um, to the database and integrate this different, these different kinds of information. So we can also do queries for orthologs, and so this is a, a cute little query here where I first started with um, what, are the, what are the most number of, uh, uh, what, is the, what are the genes that have the most number of exons? So I was interested, my, my um, graduate research was on introns, and I worked on introns in crypto, so I was interested in looking at some of these really big genes that have lots of introns, um, just to see how, how their conservation, and, and more importantly, how their cure, their annotated genomes showed up. So this is this gene that has 34 exons, and um, you can see, let's see if I go down, you can see that it has um, several orthologs across the other, um, the other species that, are, that have been sequenced. And if we jump into the, um, sorry, jump into the alignment, okay, I guess I did, that picture got lost. I, mean, I think it's going to show up in a second. But um, we can, okay, I'll just, I'll skip that for a second. So, um, yeah, here we go. If you, if you jump in and look at the, the picture, the alignment, uh, of, the, of the region, the, the, the target gene is at the top, and you can see this very large uh, gene conserved across these different species. And um, uh, you can see in some cases there are mis big missing exons, and so from a curator standpoint, it'd be easy to jump in and, and try to look at that in more detail or ask if that's something biologically meaningful. 
Um, the other thing about symptony, the orthology that I wanted to show, was that we can also um, do, do another kind of query. We pull out genes that have, let's say, looking for genes with certain, with transmembrane domains. We can take this as a, as a starting set of genes, um, and that would be, in this case, this, this set of um, 460 cryptococcus genes that have transmembrane domains, and we can ask, well, I'm interested in the ones that might be conserved with a model system like Saccharomyces, and so I can go and I can add this transform by orthology query, um, and so I can take those sets of 460 and cryptococcus, and I can say, give me the orthologs of these genes in another species, Saccharomyces, um, and I can see this conservation set. So I can see there's 300 here that are genes that are conserved um, now, there, there's not necessarily a one for one. You can see the number of ortholog groups is 100. We probably can't read that, but it says 186. And so, in some cases, there's multiple genes that fall into an ortholog cluster. But this generates um, the ability to then say, well, these are genes that, um, that, that are conserved and found in both, and they may be um, targets for some of the research if, if, if this uh, was a particular question you were asking about transmembrane. Uh, domain containing genes. Um, so this is um, just giving you some of the basic tools that we have ability to jump in and do. Um, this was that, I don't know why it was moved around, but this is just that summary of that. Not only are the, this is a large gene with lots of exons, but um, the conservation, th those exons are pretty well supported when we look at the RNA-seq in terms of all of that. So this, the whole point here is to present these tools to the researchers in a much, uh, in a easy to use fashion so that they can verify the, the the strength of the annotation and the ability to, to query these annotations for, for downstream questions. Um, okay, and then another comparative question that we often try to ask is are, are genes that are, that are um, restricted, phylogenetically restricted. And so um, coccidioides is another human fungal pathogen. It's a primary pathogen. Um, and so we're interested in some ways why it's a particularly important pathogen, uh, uh, why it's a particularly effective pathogen. And so some of the questions are about how it interacts with its host. So we can do things for looking at the, gene, the genes that might be specific to COXI. The other reason that this is important uh, to find is that COXI, uh, once you've acquired an immune, uh, um, once you've acquired an infection to COXI, if you're able to beat it, um, you do gain lifelong immunity, which means that um, progress towards a vaccine is, is possible. And actually, there's lots of good work that's been going on and, and, and shows promise there. And so identifying some of these genes that are specific to it may be good um, good candidates for some of the vaccines. And so um, we can do this pro profile query by looking for, for example, all the genes that are not found in, say, bacteria. Basically, I'm clicking on everybody, everybody but the three coxy genomes. Um, so I'm looking for, gene, for genes that are phylogenetically restricted to just this, this group of species. And I get back this list of about 2,000 genes. Um, uh, 2,000 genes that are broken, broken. If you break them down, it's into these, different, uh, these two different groups. And so I can, I can get back because these are two different strains that were sequenced at the, at the Broad. And so um, we're able to look and find these um, phylogenetically restricted ones. Um, but then we can, we can add on top of that, well, let's see if they also are secreted. So we're looking for coxy specific genes that are secreted. So we can add another step. We have this ability to do these Boolean queries to do an intersection. And we get out um, another list of genes that's, that's, of course, now much smaller. And, bio, and people are doing uh, experimental work like small gene lists, so we're, we're doing our best to narrow the gene set down to something that's, that's feasible to do work on. But really, again, it's important to um, look for these things that are, um, that are uh, meaningful for the question. And so we can, you can adjust these parameters in terms of how, how, um, how specific you want the, um, how, how many, uh, how, how confident you want to be in, in this case, the signal peptide prediction. So there's, I'm showing you the canned queries, but there, but there are little knobs you can turn as well. Okay, so this gives us the ability to um, then jump, jump through these lists and we can, um, to make a list, and if you want to make sense of this list, you can also um, query for things that, um, by looking at some of these um, word clouds, and that allows you to, to click on some of these top links here and show you word clouds. I switched species because the word cloud didn't, was not up on the old version of the browser, so I'm just showing you in, in a new version. But the point being, you have these lists of genes and you can get summaries of the types of either description, functional descriptions or Go terms that are, that are there. Um, so just to finish off, um, this canned queries are really useful, this canned data, but um, it's, it's also important to have the, the community be able to interact with this data and make notes about things that are Jane, di different or um, need to be improved or, or to add uh, links to publications. And since we, don't, we can't afford to have curators for every single genome um, out there, but the community is working on it, we'd like to be able to aggregate this information. And so um, here's an example of a gene that I've, I, I added a, a 
comment for in terms of curation um, by going up to the gene page and clicking on a link and that allows me to jump in and add information like a comment about the gene and um, PubMed ID links as well as um, uh, GenBank accessions and so forth. And the fact that this gene is found in different species, I'm able to add, if I know what the orthologs are of this gene and other species, I can put down their names in the other species in the database. So I, it allows you to put a lot of information in there. I can also um, use this form to, to make notes about um, mistakes in the genome annotation that can go um, in... Uh, if I wasn't making a publication link, I could make a link to um, corrections. So there's several ability to let the user community contribute back to this annotation. Um, and this is what you get when you, when you add the links. And then, and then at the very top here, this would be, these are comments that are associated with the, 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 the gene itself. And so the importance is not only that it's there, but it's searchable. So you can search for this and it becomes immediately available to the community. And so this is um, an important way to build um, these resources so that there can be um, the, the, we can build on this information that we've been collecting because the students and the, the, the postdocs reading the papers are going to probably know more about this information up front than, than having to build a curation team for every genome. Um, okay, and so then I, what, I, what I did is I just went back and queried for this, this annotation that I added, which was for the CR, CR1 gene. So that CR1 was not listed as a gene annotation before I had done this. Now I've added it, I can get it back. And not only do I get it for the species that I annotated it for, but because I added the links to the other genes, they're all available as one query. So um, that's, um, that's the power of having all the data in one database. Okay, so I went very fast because there are a lot of pictures of, of pages, and, and so some of those things are easier to look at on your own. So the, the links are um, available here, and I'll post the slides on, um, on SlideShare. But uh, I just wanted to give you a flavor of how we're doing these kinds of analyses. Um, this work uh, was started through a seed uh, grant from the Burroughs Welcome Foundation, and we're also folding in some of the resources that we're building uh, here with the Moby DAC project that's supported by the Sloan Foundation. Um, and it's a collaboration with the group at at UPenn that has been building the um, group, group at Penn that's been building the UPath DB database. And so um, there's been incredible um, efforts from their, their team as well as the programmers in my group. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Right, so I mean, this is a big problem, and there's, there's many other fungal genome databases, so Ensemble Genomes, the JGI, the Broad Institute, and CBI, um, there are, and so, so there's, there isn't necessarily a data exchange happening right now. Uh, it's something that we'd like to see happen. Uh, it requires standards uh, uh, that, and uh, one of the problems with genome annotation is even though there are standards for annotation, as was mentioned, you have to write a parser because some people include the stop codon in the CDS and some don't. Some people um, you know, do their GFF2 versus GFF3. They have standardized loci names, some don't. So we're all having to solve this problem um, at some point in the process. Um, and what we'd hoped could happen would be there'd be a single place to have this sort of cleaned and purified data that, that is um, standardized. Um, but that hasn't necessarily that getting funding specifically to clean up stuff isn't necessarily the first priority. So, um, but we hope that we can uh, build exchanges through this. Um, so, yes. Any other questions? Okay, thanks, Linda. Okay, I think we're ready for our last speaker of the session. Kessie, if you want to come up, please. And um, Kessie comes from...